Well, it's good to be with each one of you. Uh, it, it's morning for me, but I know that it's it's all different times for the rest of you. But it's just so precious to to uh, be able to connect this way. And uh, I thought maybe um, I'd start out with just reading uh, out of our little flock hymn book. It's hymn number 195, and it starts out, Worthy of homage and of praise, worthy by all to be adored. But the third verse says, To thee, even now, our song we raise, though sure the tribute mean must prove. That, that word mean just means it must be very small. No mortal tongue can tell thy ways so full of life and light and love. And that's the, the uh, phrase I particularly was thinking of, no mortal tongue can tell thy ways, so full of life and light and love. <clears throat> that's what I'd like to speak on um, a little. First of all, the ways of God and then to focus particularly on the way of peace. So maybe we could turn to Isaiah 55 for an in introductory verse. Isaiah 55 and, and uh, let's read um, the first part of verse three. It says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. And then verse eight says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, our lives uh, are very short. And as we get older, we're reminded more of that. We just have a certain amount of time. And it is our desire, isn't it, as, as redeemed of the Lord Jesus to, to learn what we can about him and to do what he would have us to do. And so, you know... Um, he tells us here in Isaiah 55, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, neither are your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. Last time um, I spoke, I spoke a little of that uh, poem that was found in Mr. Darby's Bible, in which it was written, Lo at thy feet, Lord Jesus, this is the place for me. Here I have learned deep lessons, truth that has set me free. Free from myself, Lord Jesus. We took that up previously. Free from the ways of men. Chains of thought that have bound me never can bind me again. And so to be freed not only from ourselves, but from uh, the ways of men, because they're the ways that, um, really involve our own natural wisdom and the ways that we learn is passing through this world and, and uh, even going to its learning institutions. We, we learn the ways of men. But here God tells us, you might say he, he um, <clears throat> gives our thoughts to turn away from these ways that we so rely on to tell us that, that his ways are completely different. And he invites us to learn them. And we really, that's what we have to do. I believe that there's two things necessary to, to learn the ways of God. One of them is to realize that we don't have them. They're not our ways. And secondly, that it, it has to be a desire to learn his ways, and then we only can learn them in his presence. 
And again, they're not only different than our ways, they're higher than our ways. The Apostle Paul, in, in, uh, as he writes the book of Romans, and, and just how the wonderful good news it's he uh, goes into such such depths because he's he's not preaching it to sinners. He's he's giving us as believers to enter in more to the fullness of it. And, you know, as he as he goes through it and, and he sees how that God concludes all in unbelief. As he goes through and, and shows how that. While he's going to bring in his wonderful salvation, that doesn't interfere or conflict with his government in this in his ways in this earth. They can still be carried on simultaneously. He points out how that, that God can show grace and yet maintain his righteous and holy character. He shows how that um he can bring in the wonderful epic the wonderful dispensation of the church and yet still keep his promises to israel and as he goes through this all oh, he comes to the end in the 11th chapter and and in consider as he considers it he just opens up and he says all oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments or untraceable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. His ways past finding out. Does that mean that we can't learn or know his ways? It doesn't mean that, but it means that we'll never come to them ourselves we have to again we have to learn them by being in his presence have you ever have you ever tried to anticipate um what the lord is going to do in someone else's life you're, you're kind of observe and you say I'll, I'll bet the lord is going to do this next and you find out no no his his ways his thoughts are so much higher or, or even in your own life you think well i think he'll, he'll probably do this then and we find out no something completely different because his ways are higher than our ways his ways are untraceable his, his uh, judgments are untraceable his ways past finding out but he wants us to know his ways and i i believe that there's a process often of learning his ways and that is to to come to discover that our own ways are not sufficient and then we want to learn his ways. And I think of that in connection with Moses. <clears throat> it says of him in, in Psalms 103. <clears throat> in verse 7, it says, he made his ways... He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. <clears throat> you know, Moses, Moses, as, as a result of being in the presence of the Lord, he learned the ways of God. Israel didn't. They got to see his acts and how he undertook for them, and they saw his wonders in the wilderness. But they didn't know the ways of God because, again, those are learned by being at his feet, by being in his presence. And Moses, I think, well, um, maybe we can uh, turn to Acts chapter 7 and see how Stephen speaks of, of uh, Moses. In Acts chapter 7, in verse 22, we read, in, in which time Moses was born and ex was exceeding fair, excuse me, no, let's, let's go to verse 22. 
And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. The next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again or, or um, had them go on in peace together, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge for us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled. And then we can drop down to verse 35. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? Notice that, a ruler and a judge, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. You know, there's a real difference, isn't there? The Lord had communicated to, to Moses that he was going to be the one that would deliver and lead out his people out of Egypt. And so as he goes in the wisdom of his own thoughts and his own ways, uh, he tries to bring that about. And first, it involves the killing of a man. And then secondly, um, to have his, his uh, brother and look at him as he tries to be this leader and, and do the will of God and, and say to him, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? But as the result, I would say, of learning the ways of God, Stephen could say, the same, this, the same, this, this Moses did God send to be a ruler or leader and a giver. That's the result of learning the ways of God. But again, Moses had to first experience that his thoughts, his ways, we're never going to accomplish what God had for him to fulfill. <clears throat> and I think we can see that back in um, Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32, and Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides, on one side and on the other were they written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tablets. Verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, and he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord for adventure, I shall make an atonement for you. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Moses had spent... 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. And when he comes down into that scene that was so contrary to the scene he just left in the presence of God, 
he takes those very stone uh, tables of stone that God himself had written on, and he shatters them at the base of the mountain. How did he know to dare to do that? Well, I believe that it was the result of having learned in God's presence the ways of God. Otherwise, he wouldn't dare to, to destroy what God had just written in stone. But then he also says to the people after he brings before them their sin, he says, yet now um, I'll go and, and try to seek to make an atonement for your sin. And he can go into the presence of God and say, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me out of thy book. And so one of the ways of God that he had learned in that time was the mercy of God. But God was a merciful God, and that's why he could, he would accept taking those stones that would have condemned the people and, and brought in death and, and breaking them and going back up into the presence of God and pleading for his people. And, you know, in, in chapter 34, then, it says in verse 7, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, was, which was without the camp. In verse 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. In verse 12, and Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, bring up the people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now this verse, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. Note that he doesn't say, show me now thy way, that I may lead this people through the wilderness. That certainly was his responsibility and what God had given him to do. But it has struck me that he, he doesn't say that he wants to learn God's way, that he may be able to do that. That's the only way he could, but his particular and first purpose was that I may know thee, and I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he, God, said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. How did Moses know to take the, the tabernacle or the tent and pitch it outside the camp again he learned the ways of God in holiness and he realized that's what was um, the thing that was very important to do at that time with the sin in the camp but then he goes to the Lord and he says in effect Lord I can't do this job I can't lead a million and a half people through the wilderness he didn't know at that time i'm sure that it was going to be for 40 years but just that impossible job and so he says you haven't said who you'll send with me and he says if thy presence go not with me carry us not up hence and then he says show me now thy way well he learned that day the God is not only holy, the God is not only merciful, but the Lord revealed to him that he was gracious. And it was going to be by his grace that Moses would be able to lead his people to the promised land. And when you think of 40 years of what he <laughs> endured and all the complaining and the murmuring, and the, and the sinning and the tempting God and, and so on, how is he sustained? 
we know it was only because he learned the ways of God. God showed his ways unto Moses. And Moses appreciated them. And he so valued those ways that he realized that through learning the ways of God, he was learning God. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. So I thought maybe that we could... Uh, Turn to Luke chapter one and just focus on one of those ways. In Luke chapter 1, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, he, because of his unbelief, had been silenced. And then when uh, his son was born, John was born, the Lord loosed his lips. It's quite a thing for a man that hasn't been able to speak for nine months to uh, suddenly be able to speak. What's he going to say? Well, God had wrought with him and and. He, he says in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, speaking about the Lord Jesus. And then in verse 77 of Luke 1, it says, To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And now this is what I had in mind particularly, to guide our feet into the way of peace. I don't doubt that this has a particularly a millennial um significance to it that that's what the spirit of god had in mind in what zachariah said because they were anticipating the messiah bringing in uh, his kingdom but i think that we can also enjoy this way of peace as believers in the lord jesus in our pathway now and i enjoyed going through the book of Luke recently and reading of all the different instances where the Lord Jesus brought in healing and deliverance and blessing and to trace in those ways how he would guide. He'd first bring in peace or deliverance and then he guides the feet of that one into the way of peace. Because, you know, even in the millennium, God is going to bring about peaceful conditions. He's going to put down all enemies. He's going to put down all opposition. War is going to be heard of no more. Um, the earth will flourish wonderfully. So he'll bring in that condition of peace. But, you know, it says in Isaiah 2, 3, um, he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. So while there will be conditions of peace, Israel and the nations will need to learn the way of peace. Romans 3 tells us the way of peace have they not known. We don't know it naturally. So we need to be taught the way of peace. And it's beautiful that the Lord Jesus not only brings peace, but then guides our feet into the way of peace. And there are multiple times um, you think of, of uh, when the disciples were in the boat, the Lord Jesus was sleeping in the rear of the boat and, and the storm came up. It was very evident that if things continued, the boat, it was actually in the process of sinking. And then they awaken the Lord and say, carousel not that we perish. You know, he rises up and he, he brings in peace. He stills the wind and the wave, the storm. But even though he's brought peace, 
he wants to guide their feet into the way of peace. And so he says to them, um, "Why were, where's your faith? Why were you feel fearful, oh, ye of little faith? And, you know, they marvel and they say, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? So not only did he bring about peace in, on the... Um, in their present circumstances, but he gave their hearts to reflect now. You know, this, this blessed man, he's not only a deliverer, he can not only heal, he can not only feed, but the very elements that we so fear sometimes that are completely out of our control, they're not out of his control. What manner of man is this? That's one of the ways of peace, but I would just like to look at two instances in Luke where he guides, he brings in peace, and then he guides this one into the way of peace. So in Luke chapter 8, in verse 43, Luke 8, 43, it says, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. You know, this woman, I think if you were her neighbor, it's very possible that, or one of, you might say in our language, uh, one of the brethren in her assembly, it's very possible that you might not have known she had this infirmity. Because it's an infirmity that made you unclean, everything you sat on, everything you laid on, even that others touched after you did, made them unclean. What a, what a difficult affliction to have. And yet it's something that you could keep hidden if you were careful. And I, I, I rather think that she did. Of course, she went to the doctor. Um, she would have to go to the doctor and, and see what he could do. But in the ways of God, she went to many physicians and spent everything that she had. And uh, Mark tells us she not only didn't get better, she got worse. You know, I, I suggest that perhaps each one of us have something in our life that we don't want our brethren to know. We don't even want our associates to know. We may be somewhat successful and keeping it hidden, covered. It might be even something in the past. It might be a present infirmity. It might be the plague of our own heart. But something that we want to remain hidden. And I, I say that because this woman, when she comes up to the Lord, first I might say that there was wonderful faith with her. Even though she had gone to all these physicians and, and actually got worse, when she heard of the Lord Jesus, she said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I think that's in, um, um, That's in Matthew 9, 21, where she says, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. There was 
full confidence that the Lord could heal her. Um, so it wasn't a lack of faith, but she says distinctly that she came up behind him. And maybe when we first read it, we just say, well, there was a huge crowd and that just happened to be the avenue that she could get up to him. But it seems like as you read it in all the gospels, with a purpose, she thought to just come sneak up behind him, not even touch him, just touch the hem of his garment. And she was confident that she would be healed. And she did that. And she was healed. It says she felt in her in her body that she was healed. Now she can just slip away. None will be any the wiser for it. And that's exactly what she tried to do. And the Lord, because he loved her and wanted her to know the way of peace, he wanted to guide her feet into the way of peace. He didn't let her slip away. He said, who touched not my garment, but who touched me? And we read how that it says, when all denied. You know, if you and I are living before men, and so much we do, there will be times in order to maintain this image or that they wouldn't know our weakness or infirmity or, or this matter that's afflicted us, uh, we won't be truthful. At the least, we may give a false front or a false impression to try to maintain what they think of us. And so she denied. When the Lord turned around, she must have said, wasn't me. But the Lord didn't leave that her there. And of course, the disciples came to her aid and said, Lord, all these people touching you and pushing you and stuff, and you ask who touched me? But you know, he must have kept looking at that woman. And whatever she saw in his eyes, whatever she sensed in his voice, it says, in verse 47, when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people, nothing hidden, everyone there, for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. You might say in our language, she was a believer. But even as believers, we can have this anxiety, this continual um, lack of peace, trying to maintain our image before our fellow man that the Lord wants to relieve us of. And you know, that very, that very seeking to preserve that will keep us from the enjoyment of what he thinks of us and what we are to him. So he, he says to her, fear not. Um, excuse me, uh, daughter, daughter, imagine. She, I don't know if the Lord said that directly to any of the others as he, as he healed and blessed. Perhaps he did. I meant to look that up. But from the Son of God himself, she heard, daughter, be of good comfort. You're mine. I want you to go in peace. And you know, even if everyone else knows now what your difficulty was, I love you, and you're my daughter. We don't want to miss that. It will give us such peace if we lay hold of what we mean to him and the enjoyment of our relationship as the sons of God, as the children of God, as the household of God. 
And again, this matter of, of trying to maintain or keep hidden um, is conflicting with the enjoyment of that. Let's look at the other one in, in uh, Luke chapter 10. One that we all know well. And uh, I will just be speak, reminding us of things we already know. But it says in Luke chapter 10 in verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered. And I... I wanted to read this in Jandy's translation, excuse me. Uh, verse uh, 40. Now Martha was, he says, distracted with much serving. And coming up, she said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Speak to her, therefore, that she may help me. But Jesus answering said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but there is need of one, and Mary has chosen the good part, the which shall not be taken from her. You know, in a nice way, Martha was trying to bring before the Lord that he was distracting Mary. And he needed to tell her to help her sister. But here the word of God says, actually, Martha was distracted. <clears throat> you know, I think of that verse in um, said Isaiah, I, I think I wrote it down here. Um, Thou wilt keep in perfect peace the mind stayed on thee, for he confideth in thee. <clears throat> the Lord really had, had directed Mary into the way of peace. And even when her sister, who didn't have that peace, came to him and you know she was she was doing a good thing she was seeking to serve the lord isn't it something that our service for the lord can actually become more to us than he himself that's a danger and so here she is understandably trying to get ready for the lord to provide a wonderful meal for the lord and she sees her sister sitting at his feet and she doesn't have an appreciation for that but you know mary mary's proving that she's sitting at his feet wonderful place of of the proper attitude in the presence of the lord but then she's listening to his word she wants to learn all that she can in the time that she has you and I have more years, have had more years. You might say she really maybe at the most had three years. And she realized the importance of that time of sitting at his feet. And so here's this conflicting time where she can also be involved in his service. But she has a priority that she doesn't want to lose what she gains in that place. And, you know, you and I don't want to either. I There's an old widow sister that lives in an assembly. She's Romanian. She lives in an assembly not too far from Walla Walla, where I live. And um, I call her in the spirit of the Apostle Paul in Romans. I call her mom. Rufus's mother wasn't Paul's biological mother, and neither is, is this sister my mother. But 
I call her mom because she's been such a help to me. She's a woman of faith. And every time I have the privilege of seeing her, I say to her, Mom, what do you have for me this time? And one of the times I asked her that, she said, well, you know, um, in Matthew 6, 6, where it says, and when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and shut the door and pray to thy father in secret. I said, yeah, I remember that. She said, well, lock it. I said, really? Yes, lock it. I said, why? She said, because that's the time that is indispensable for you to be here for his delight and joy. That's the time that you cannot dispense with if you're going to fulfill what is his will in your life. And there's everything, the enemy will try everything he can because he knows that to try to interrupt that time. She said, don't take your phone in with you because those little things, you know, you're going, oh, yeah, I wonder who that is. I. But she said, don't even take in your anxious thoughts as to what you have to do to work and the things that the time limits that you have and so on. She said that time is just for him and it's just with him. And don't go in there with any agitation because then you can't sit quietly in his presence. Yes, to read and pray, that's essential. But just to sit and to listen and to learn his heart and to learn his ways. And so when, when Martha, not enjoying this, is agitated, the Lord says to her, Martha, you need to learn. You need what Mary's enjoying. You need this. And if I could put words in his mouth, he would have said, I would far rather you be here right with her and we could skip the meal. I value your presence and, and being able to speak to your heart more than anything else. We're told in Mark 3, is it? He chose 12 that they might be with him and then he might send them out. First of all, that they might be with him. And then he says to her, that part, that she has chosen, and, and it is a matter of choice, isn't it? Our priorities in life, and that priority in particular, is only the result of making definite choices where we have to determine that we're going to let this go, but we can't let that go. But our, our um, I, I forgot my thought right there, but um, oh, it said, the Lord said, this part that she's chosen, it won't be taken away from her. You know, much of the anxiety and, and distress that we carry in our life is the result of fearing that we're going to lose something that we have, isn't it? Maybe monetarily, maybe our possessions. Maybe our house, maybe our health, maybe even our loved ones. The fear that we are going to lose them. And so the Lord says, Mary's got something in this she can't lose. And I, I can see we're running out of time again. Let's, let's just look and see how indeed she can't lose them. Because you come to John chapter 11. We know that each time you find Mary, you find her at the feet of the Lord Jesus. But now she's in the sorrow of death. What a test for our peace. And, excuse me, that's in, in um, I was going to read it, I guess, in the J and D's again. I'm sorry.
in John chapter 11, we know that Lazarus has died. The sisters are heartbroken. They had sent to the Lord. He had delayed. And then he came when she had died. And in a verse 20, it says, Martha is one that was covered with many things. Then when she heard Jesus is coming, went to meet him. But notice Mary sat in the house. Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But even now I know that whatever thou shalt ask of God, God will give thee. Jesus says to her and so on. You know, I think sometimes we shortchange Martha, but Martha is actually saying here, if I understand, you didn't come here when my brother was alive. You could have kept him from dying. But even though you've delayed, you can still ask God. And I, I only take it that she, she was in, inferring that God would raise him up. But she's not at peace, is she? She's, she's trying to direct the Lord. And so the Lord speaks to her very graciously. But you know, Mary, because she learned the way of peace, she didn't leave. She comes to the Lord while, while Martha goes to the Lord. Let's see. In verse 28. And having said this, she went away and called her sister Mary, secretly saying, the teacher has come and calls thee. When Mary hears that, it says, she, when she heard that, rises up quickly and comes to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was in the place where Martha came to meet him. The Jews, therefore, who were with her in the house, consoling her, seeing Mary, that she rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she goes to the tomb, that she may weep there. Mary, therefore, when she came where Jesus was, seeing him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You know, we might say and have said, well, she said the same thing as Martha. It seems like you're, you're giving Mary credit where she doesn't have it. But the very fact that she could remain in the house until the Lord sent for her shows that she didn't have any reproach to bring to the Lord that this isn't said to the Lord in reproach that if you had been here in time, this wouldn't have happened. But she was simply saying, because she knew him as sitting at his feet, I know that if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But she doesn't say like Martha, but you can, you know, you can ask God. That's all she says. And there she is at his feet. That's all she wants. She's content, even in the midst of her sorrow. In the presence of death, she's at peace, though she can weep. And her being there in that place brought out the sentiments and the heart of the Lord Jesus. Something that Martha didn't see. Maybe she saw it there, I don't know. But she didn't see it when she went to the Lord. But when the Lord looked at Mary sitting at his feet, his own heart was free to express itself, the, the, the sentiment, the deep feelings that he had as he saw the sorrow that sin brought in. And so we have that wonderful short verse, Jesus wept. And that's what we learn, isn't it, at, at the feet of the Lord Jesus. We not only learn his ways, but we learn his heart. We know his comfort. And that's the only comfort that can give us to rise above and be peaceful in the midst of even the sorrows of death, which are very real. Well, I want to look at um, the last time that she's at his feet in the next chapter, John chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where was the dead man Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from among the dead. There, therefore, they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary, therefore, having taken a pound of ointment of pure nard of great price, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. One of his disciples, therefore Judas, son of Simon, who was about to deliver him up, says, 
why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii or pence and given to the poor? But he said, um, verse 7, Jesus therefore said, suffer her to have kept that for the day of my preparation for burial. For you have the poor always with you, but me, you have not always. You know, here is, here is a time when Mary, no doubt her, her, her time being at the Lord's feet, she had learned what he was going to do. And she wanted to be prepared for that moment, and she was. And she took what she had been keeping up for, I don't know how long, but something that, that was her treasure, you might say, probably her dearest earthly treasure. And she wanted to break it, spend it all, pour it all out on the Lord Jesus. And she does that. <clears throat> and we know that it's a picture of worship. Here she is able to give back to him something of the expression of what she's learned and come to treasure in being able to, as he says, she's done what she could. She wasn't going to change his course to the cross and in her intelligence, no doubt she didn't want to, but she wanted to do what she could. And so in this act, it is so beautiful of worship, picture of worship. She does something for him that is very, very precious to his heart. I, let's take a moment just to turn to Mark 14. In verse 3, it says, this is the same incident. It's looked at in a little different perspective, but it's the same incident. It speaks about her taking an alabaster flask, flask of ointment, pure, very costly. Having broken it, she poured it out. And verse 4 says, and there were some indignant in themselves. Notice, indignant in themselves, saying, why has this waste been made of the ointment? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 pence and given to the poor. And notice they spoke very angrily at her. Can you imagine this moment that you prized, that you waited for? That you came as Mary and broke, didn't reserve anything, and poured it all out on the one that you so love and appreciate. This is your opportunity and to have the response be, what a wait, what are you doing? To have those that you would look for some encouragement and approval to, to be indignant and to be angry and to speak at you angrily. Is she going to lose that portion, that, that part that won't be taken away from her? You know, I've seen this in, in the lives of some of our older brethren that Right at the end, when they're weakened and so on, they experience something that is so difficult, something that they, they wouldn't have expected to happen, and, and the Lord allowed it to happen. And so here's a, such a test for Mary. And I, I want to say there's for the sisters that are listening, and I know you've heard this before, but, you know, you come to that precious breaking of bread meeting and you don't say anything you have the privilege of singing but I've often felt you know sometimes we have a breaking of bread and the scriptures that are brought out and the prayers that are prayed we say at the end you say no wonder I mean that was a lovely breaking of bread how our hearts were just drawn up and out in worship to the Lord but there are other times when maybe the the scriptures weren't so unusual or so particularly 
um, remarkable. The prayers weren't anything, you know, unusual. And yet, when you came to the end of it, when we came to the end of it, we all felt so encouraged and so refreshed. And I just suggest that you say, how did that, how is that? I, I think it was because there were sisters there that were like Mary. They didn't say, she didn't say anything, but they were so in the enjoyment of his love and worship flowing from their hearts that we all, like the house was filled with the odor of the ointment, we all benefit from it. So no sisters that you play a very real part, I think in the enjoyment of that meeting. Um, but to think that to do that, you might say to give all at that point and to take even your hair. <clears throat> she took her hair and wiped his feet. You know, that, that that's a woman's glory. Suddenly it's all oily and probably not very attractive. It's like, I think, the woman covering her head in the presence of the Lord, her glory, because she wants his glory to be before her soul and the soul of everyone. But to think of that moment being the moment when you were, you were, have these ones, the, the disciples themselves indignant and to speak angrily. But it wasn't taken away from her, was it? That portion was not taken away from her. The Lord steps in and he says in verse 8 of Mark 14, what she could do, she has done. She has beforehand anointed my body for the burial. And verily, I say unto you, I want you to learn this. I want you to know this. Wherever these glad tidings may be preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall be also spoken of for a memorial for her. Could we have any doubt of what it meant to his heart, regardless of those that were there that should have appreciated it, not appreciating it? The Lord says, you know, wherever this gospel is preached, wherever you tell souls about how much God loves them, and how he sent his son and gave his son for their salvation. You need to accompany it with this, what this woman did. That's how much he appreciated it. Tell them, when you tell them the gospel, not only how much God loved them, but tell them how much God can make them love him. And so what, a, what an approbation from the Lord Jesus. And what a beautiful testimony that her part was not taken away. She learned. He guided her feed into the way of peace and it couldn't be taken from her i'm over time i just want to close with one verse that i think sums up what i've been saying it's a precious verse to me i'm going to read it again in the j and d translation it says but the lord of peace Remember this, he's the Lord of peace. You will never have peace apart from the Lord because he's the Lord of peace. You'll either give it or withhold it, but it's found in him, found in his presence. But it says, but the Lord of peace himself give you peace continually in every way. The Lord be with you all. Give you peace himself continually in every way. Well, should I pray, Brother Leo?